Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Multiple Sclerosis Association of America's live webinar, How to Search for the Right MS Therapy for You. My name is Peter Demiri. I am the Vice President of Programs and Services for MSAA and will be your host for tonight's program. I'm looking forward to having a great presentation and very honored to have a top MS expert here tonight to present on MS and MSAA's search program. At this time, I'd like to introduce our guest presenter, Dr. Carrie M. Hirsch. Dr. Hirsch is an MS neurologist at the Cleveland Clinic Lou Rubo Center for Brain Health in Las Vegas, Nevada. Dr. Hirsch has presented her clinical research at numerous national meetings and has also published many articles on multiple sclerosis. Dr. Hirsch, thank you for being here and welcome to the program. I would also like to thank our supporters of the MSAA Search Initiative. Tonight's webinar, as well as other search projects, have been made possible with the support of EMD Serono and Sanofi Genzyme. Tonight's webinar will be archived on our website along with a copy of the slides within a week to 10 days. In addition to the webinar, MSAA provides a wide array of programs and services designed to improve the lives of people with MS today. Listed here are just some of the many services we provide, all free of charge, including our mobile phone app for MS known as My MS Manager, our comprehensive website that includes publications, videos, other archive webinars, and of course our search program, our very popular equipment and cooling programs, the return, thankfully, of our MRI Access Fund program, which we are very happy for, in-person public education programs, and our brand new online peer-to-peer -peer community known as My MSAA Community. Now these are just some of the many programs MSAA offers, and I invite everyone to go to our website at mymsaa.org or give us a call and participate in our programs and services. And speaking of participation, we want to make this webinar as lively and interactive as possible. In doing so, we ask that you submit your questions to Dr. Hirsch by typing in the chat box on the lower left side of the screen. We ask that your questions are general in nature so they can apply to the group rather than being very specific to your particular medical situation. We hope to dedicate the last 10 or 15 minutes of the program toward Q&A. I will collect the questions as they come in and try to get as many answered as time allows. Please know Dr. Hirsch will not be able to respond to those questions as she's presenting, but I will take them and ask as many as I can toward the end. We also ask if you could complete a follow-up survey at the end of the program, which is very quick, to let us know about this webinar and future topics of interest that MSAA could host. Now just a note on the technical side. If you are experiencing any technical problems with the webinar, you can use the chat box that I mentioned in uh, responding to the moderator that we have for the program. So we have an online moderator with us for the entire program, and that moderator will respond to your chat if you're having issues technically related, whether you have an echo sound or you're not getting a connection or you've been bounced and you have to log back on, anything in that regard, please type it in the chat box and the moderator will see it and respond to you. And just one last reminder that the webinar, again, will be archived soon and posted for a later date. So at this point, I am very happy to turn the program over to Dr. Hirsch and begin. Okay. Well, first of all, I would like to thank the Multiple Sclerosis Association of America for inviting me uh, to give this very important talk to you all today. And I would also like to thank the participants for taking time out of their very busy schedules to listen in on this important topic. So uh, the objectives for today's webinar are one, to explore the changing landscape of multiple sclerosis, 
looking at both uh, current and future treatments that are on the horizon. Uh, we're also going to discuss the importance of treatment adherence and compliance, why it is so important for folks who are being treated for MS with disease-modifying therapies, and making sure that they are taking their medications consistently and appropriately. Uh, we are also going to look and discuss today's doctor-patient relationships and how both sides can work together in determining the best treatment for folks with MS. And lastly, but not leastly, learn about MSAA search program, which can help your decision to choose the right MS therapy for you. So let me uh, introduce the uh, current landscape of multiple sclerosis and how it has changed over time and what makes the field of MS so um, exciting at this point. So before 1993, there were no FDA-approved medications, meaning no commercially available medicines for the prevention of MS. And as you can see based on this um, uh, picture of the slide, the MS landscape looked very barren indeed. Um, there was a very limited approach to treating symptoms and managing the disease. And as I had mentioned, there really weren't any good therapies that were available in preventing worsening of the MS, the progression of the MS, and preventing disability over time. And there really weren't any consistent uses of rehabilitation services simply because it was not very well understood what kind of benefits they provided to folks who were living with MS. But because of the limited options at that time, there were some general uh, practice advices that were given to patients. And those included go home and rest, not, don't try to do too much. Um, don't get exposed to the heat because we understand that the heat can make your symptoms feel worse. And even surprisingly, you may want to consider not having children. So the advice that was given some time ago was a little bit antiquated. Certainly, uh, we have uh, changed the way that we approach the treatment of MS, considering the amount of research that we've been able to do, and of course, our anecdotal experience with how folks do in the clinic setting. So we have certainly made some excellent strides in the growing field of MS. Since 1993, the barren desert has been transformed into a fertile, growing landscape. And I actually like that allegory because we are one of the fastest growing areas of medicine there is in terms of treatment of MS and how we manage our patients in clinic. So one of the ways that we have flourished so consistently is because there have been more than a dozen um, FDA-approved treatments for MS with more under development. So we actually have a slew of disease-modifying therapies that are either coming out into commercial availability shortly, or we have a lot of provocative therapies that are currently being studied in clinical trials to test how effective they are for the treatment of MS. Uh, it's also flourishing because we have adopted a more comprehensive approach to treating and managing the disease with an increased focus on rehabilitation and health and wellness. And we understand that even though using disease-modifying therapies where appropriate are pivotal in treating and managing MS in the long term, there are other things that folks can do to increase their quality of life and also increase their function. Those things include physical therapy, occupational therapy, and of course, taking care of yourself uh, altogether. And then of course, expand uh, symptom management treatment and strategies. So meaning we have been able to put together a more comprehensive way of treating pain and tingling and walking problems and fall prevention. 
So as I had uh, talked about previously, there are new long-term treatments that are on the horizon. So one medicine in particular that is currently being studied in clinical trials is a medication called saponamod or BAF. And this is actually an oral medicine, a medicine that someone takes by pill that is very similar in structure and function as sphingolamod, which is otherwise known as gelenia. And this particular uh, tr uh, potential treatment strategy um, looks to be so promising is because it has shown some very positive benefits preliminarily in folks with secondary progressive multiple sclerosis. So currently, all of our medicines are commercially approved to treat relapsing multiple sclerosis. And this medication may actually be one of the first of its kind to treat the secondary progressive MS folks. And all of this data was recently announced at our European meeting in London just last month showing a positive benefit in delaying disability progression in those with secondary progressive MS in a phase three clinical trial. So we um, are expecting great things from this particular uh, treatment strategy. Another strategy that looks like it's going to be quite exciting is another medicine called ofatumumab. And this is a medicine that is given by an injection underneath the skin once a month that functions very similarly to medicines that are already used for MS, one called rituximab, and another medicine that we are waiting with bated breath for it to become FDA approved and commercially available to our folks with MS. And one of the reasons why this is an exciting medicine is because we find that it has demonstrated um, a significant reduction in the number of relapses and new MRI lesions in early phase two clinical trials. And we did not see any unexpected uh, safety findings. Um, it has a more human structure to our own proteins and the way that our cells interact. So we expect the side effect profile to actually be quite promising. And then, of course, because of its um, promising administration, where it's only administered uh, once a month, as opposed to some other injectable medicines, which are more frequent. So we've got a lot of upcoming therapeutics that look pretty promising in the field. So a note about adherence. This is very simple. Research has proven that most folks with MS of the relapsing remitting form who start and continue using a disease modifying therapy accumulate less disability over time and at a slower rate than patients who do not take their medication as prescribed. So it is certainly very important that when someone starts a medicine, a preventative strategy for their MS, that they take the medicine as it is prescribed. And of course, if there are any problems with adhering because of a number of issues, it would be important for that person to communicate those problems to their MS healthcare provider so other strategies can be implemented to make sure that that person is on a medicine that they can take compliantly. So these are just some funny cartoons that um, demonstrate why having a good doctor-patient relationship is so important. So on the left-hand side of the screen, you see a cartoon of a patient or someone checking into a front desk at a doctor's office, and the receptionist uh, stating to the person, your appointment with the doctor is at 11.15, but his appointment with you is at 12.15. And then that same person going into the doctor's office that you can see on the right-hand panel saying, give it to me straight, doc. How long do I have to ignore your advice? So basically, this is just demonstrating that there needs to be clear communication between the healthcare provider and the person living with MS so that a healthy relationship can be brought on and that will help 
facilitate conversations in the future in trying to determine what is the best treatment, what is the best disease modifying therapy for that individual. So I had mentioned uh, earlier in the presentation that there is certainly a changing landscape of MS that is very exciting. And the current FDA-approved MS disease-modifying therapies, or DMTs for short, um, are listed on this slide. So there are multiple self-injected medications, and they include Avonex, Betaseron, Copaxone, Xtavia, Glatopa, Clagrity, Rebif, and Zimbrita. So you can see that there are a whole slew of different medicines. And they differ by administration schedule. Some of them are daily injections. Some of them are three times per week. Some of them are every other day. Um, one of them is once every two weeks. So they do um, differ by how often the person needs to administer the medicine. And they also differ by where they are administering the medicine. Most of the medicines listed on the left-hand side are underneath the skin or called subcutaneous injections. But then one of them, Avonex, is actually an intramuscular medicine. So the actual administrations of where they go into the body are a little bit different as well. We also have some very effective medicines, um, which are infusion medications. And what I mean by infusion medications is that the person would go to an infusion site where an IV, an intravenous uh, catheter, would be placed into the person's arm, and the medicine would actually run in a bag and it can range anywhere from an hour to several hours for that particular infusion, depending upon which of the medicines uh, is being infused. So those medicines include Lemtrada, Novantron, and Tisabri. And they all differ by potential side effects and different complications, um, how they are monitored long term, what are the potential safety issues, and then, of course, the administration schedule, how often the medicine is being administered. And then lastly, we have oral medications as well. These are medicines that are taken by pill. Two of the medicines, Abagio and Gelenia, are once-a-day pills, and Tecfidera is a twice-a-day pill. All three of these medicines were FDA approved not until 2010, so they are fairly new medicines. They also differ by different side effects and long-term complications, and of course the administration schedule is a little different as well. So as you can see from this slide, there are multiple medicines that are available, so this is where the conversation with the healthcare provider is very important to try to decide what is the best medicine for, for you, and then how to have an open and honest conversation with your healthcare provider so that your concerns are actually being addressed. So I think that this uh, medicine um, might be a little out of um, 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 order, but um, this is another um, new long-term treatment that's on the horizon. This is ocrelizumab. Um, ocrelizumab is um, one of the medicines that I had alluded to that we anticipate will be approved for commercial use either by the end of this year or the beginning of 2017. The reason why this medicine is so exciting is because it has a very similar structure to rituximab, which is a highly effective potential treatment strategy off-label for multiple sclerosis, but it's also the first of its kind to demonstrate positive benefit in patients with primary progressive MS. And this is something that has never been done before. And so we are very excited that there is the possibility of a, of a treatment strategy, not only that is excellent for folks with relapsing forms of MS, 
but with progressive forms of MS too. Now this is to say that the ocrelizumab uh, will potentially be FDA approved for primary progressive MS, which means that these folks essentially had a progressive course of MS from the very beginning as opposed to having an initial relapsing remitting course and then eventually becoming more progressive over time. That is secondary progressive MS. We do not currently have sufficient data to support um, its potential insurance approval for secondary progressive MS, but we are hopeful that we will be able to maybe see some benefit in observational studies. So we have yet to anticipate where the secondary progressive folks will lie in terms of using the ocrelizumab. But we are very excited about its uh, potential commercial use uh, coming up in 2017, so we'll need to stay tuned. So the importance of having a good doctor-patient relationship. So given the complexity of MS, the doctor and patient must work together to understand the problems and find successful solutions. So this is done in many different ways. So the most important thing that I would strive for everybody with MS is to find a healthcare provider that they feel that they can establish an open and honest doctor-patient rapport because this ultimately will help foster mutual trust, enhanced accuracy of the diagnosis and the treatment strategy. It will also enhance adherence and compliance because if a person understands why they are taking a medicine in the first place, there may be um, an increased thought process that, yes, I need to make sure that I am taking this compliantly to make sure that my MS disease is under fair control. But it's also important for the doctor to have an open and honest relationship with you because they need to also hear out the patient if they're saying that they're having problems with side effects, tolerability, then that means that that medicine may not be for them because it's going to uh, possibly impact their ability to take the medicine as prescribed. Having a good and honest doctor-patient communication relationship will also increase patient satisfaction and reduce complaints. And of course, it will enhance the best possible health and overall quality of life. So these are ways that um, this process can be helped. So it's very important to be proactive and to take charge of your own health care. And there are some credible internet sites um, and research information that is available to help foster some of these things. Um, keeping a journal is actually important. So if you have particular symptoms of MS, and it can be quite overly daunting because there can be so many potential symptoms of MS, keeping a journal um, is helpful, um, not only for yourself in keeping track of how you are doing, but also to communicate that information to the healthcare provider when you go in for your regularly scheduled visit to either discuss starting a new medicine or to discuss how you are doing on the current medicine you're on. There are also some very useful free uh, applications that are available on smartphones, such as MSAA's My MS Manager. And then, of course, there are other ways to maintain healthcare needs and appointments uh, through the help of your healthcare provider's office, social work, um, family, friends, and then, of course, other um, nonprofit foundations like the MSAA. And of course, um, it's important to understand the reduced time that physicians have to spend with their patients and to make sure that if you have specific questions that you want addressed, to come prepared. Come with a list of questions, of priority questions, that you would like to address at your next visit. So that way, um, the reduced amount of time that you have with your doctor can be well spent. 
and then using MSAA's search model to discuss your MS treatment options and make an informed decision, which is essentially the topic that we are going to be talking about this evening. So what is SEARCH? So MSAA's SEARCH acronym um, helps you remember, organize, and of course prioritize important questions to discuss with your doctor or your healthcare team. And each letter represents key areas that need to be discussed when you are looking for the most appropriate MS treatment, hence the acronym SEARCH. So it stands for safety, effectiveness, access, risks, convenience, and health outcomes, which uh, incorporates the overall wellness and quality of life that the individuals have. So let's discuss safety. So these would be some suggested questions um, that you could possibly come in when you are either discussing a new disease-modifying therapy or if you have questions pertaining to the one that you are currently on. So some of these questions include, what are the long-term safety profiles of these FDA-approved DMTs? So this is certainly a big one. And especially in folks who have other comorbidities or other medical problems that you feel or your doctor may feel may impede or impact the use of a certain medicine, this would certainly be the time to bring that possibility up. Another important question is what tests are required prior to taking or while receiving certain DMTs? And of course this is important because you will probably need to start prioritizing um, when you need to get these tests done, how often you need to get these tests done, and then of course the timing of when you see your healthcare provider and having those test results available so they will be able to um, adequately assess the safety of you continuing the current medicine that you're on. Another important question is how will DMTs interact with my current medical treatments or other medical conditions and any complementary and alternative medicines? So in addition to the possibility of an MS therapy impacting um, another medical condition other than MS itself, of course uh, other people are on multiple other medications whether or not they are related to MS itself, like a symptom medicine, or medicines that they're on because of another underlying medical condition. And if that DMT will, some, will somehow have an interaction with the DMT. So that will also be very important to discuss with your healthcare provider. And of course, any complementary and alternative medicines. These include herbals and vitamins and other strategies that you may uh, involve in your care. And then the last question, what are the concerns about pregnancy or breastfeeding while taking one of these DMTs? So most of the DMTs that are commercially available are not considered safe during pregnancy. And they are also not recommended to be used during breastfeeding. So it's important to discuss with the healthcare provider how you will um, plan pregnancy if that is something that you still would like to do, what is the timing and what is the best strategy in trying to plan pregnancy around the treatment of your MS and when would be the most ideal time for you. And of course, talking to your doctor about breastfeeding. So breastfeeding currently is highly recommended in folks because of the increased health of the baby. And it's important to, describe, uh, to discuss with your healthcare provider um, how imminent do they feel that the disease-modifying therapy needs to be restarted after uh, giving birth to the baby, or if, they're, if they feel that there um, is some time for the patient to breastfeed safely. So those are certainly questions to um, discuss with the healthcare provider in terms of safety. So the next uh, letter in the acronym search is effectiveness. 
So some of these um, questions that you may want to consider when talking about a DMT is, of course, how effective are they in reducing relapses, disability, and MRI activity? Now, from what we understand, all of the DMTs are designed to prevent these things, prevent new relapses, prevent new MRI activity, and prevent accumulation of disability. But of course, all of these medicines differ in terms of how effective they are, how well they work. So this is certainly a question to discuss with the healthcare provider when starting a treatment. Another question, what are my realistic expectations regarding the effectiveness of these DMTs? So meaning, what are the appropriate expectations we should have in terms of what the medicine actually does? So having the expectation that these medicines are going to reverse disability or that they're going to treat a particular symptom are probably not realistic expectations of these medicines. These medicines are there to prevent worsening of the disease. They are not curative and they don't repair. So again, these would be expectations to discuss with the healthcare provider. Another question, how can I tell if my DMT is working? So this question is actually a very popular one because some folks may not realize it's working because, well, if they're not treating symptoms and they're not taking away any disability they already have, how do I know that it's working at all? So some of these things to discuss would be the absence of relapses and, of course, the absence of any new MRI lesions that are, uh, that are formed uh, using surveillance uh, brain and spinal cord MRIs as the healthcare provider sees appropriate. And, of course, making sure that in your subsequent visits with the healthcare provider to make sure that there isn't any new disability or worsening of disability compared to your previous visits. And then when should I consider using a different DMT? So that's also an important question to bring up to the healthcare provider. When is it appropriate if you don't feel that the medicine is working, either because you've had relapses or there are new enhancing lesions on an MRI, um, how much are we going to tolerate? How much disease activity are we going to tolerate while you're on this medicine? So another very important um, collection of questions to ask in terms of effectiveness. In terms of access, so this is very important. So access to DMTs and the ability to switch therapies can certainly vary depending on the insurance provider, the coverage levels, and of course other restrictions to their policies. Um, the MSAA actually has a comprehensive uh, website um, and there's a section called My Health Insurance Guide and it helps folks come up with a better understanding um, and how to utilize their health insurance um, when trying to figure out whether or not a medicine will be covered. And so some suggested questions are which DMTs are covered by my insurance carrier, which may or may not be readily knowable at the time of your visit, uh, which is um, one of the questions that you would want to have with the office and the healthcare provider. Uh, what are their tier levels? How does that affect cost? And of course, are there any assistance programs through the pharmaceutical companies or other charities or governmental programs that are available? So of course, this differs greatly from insurance company to insurance company. And then, of course, it's not merely just the insurance company, it's also where in the United States that you live. So these insurance policies can certainly change from state to state. So these are all things that um, the MSAA has some help, uh, helpful information on. And of course, to bring up any of these questions during your visit with the healthcare provider to see if they would be able to answer some of these questions ahead of time. And then sometimes it's not quite known and we simply have to see what the insurance company is going to come back with. 
And um, each pharmaceutical company has its own separate patient assistance program. So how much are they willing to cover if the insurance company will not cover 100% of the cost? So risk is the R in the search acronym. And some very important questions to consider would be, what are the risk of side effects with these DMTs? So I had alluded to the fact that many of these DMTs have very different side effects, and that is certainly the case. So if there are particular side effects that you are concerned about, then this is certainly something to bring up with your healthcare provider when you're talking about a treatment strategy. And not only what these side effects are, but how frequent are they and how severe are they? Those would be some important things to know as well. And then, of course, if you develop side effects, what can you expect in terms of how soon should they go away? How, how soon should they resolve on their own? And with some of the medicines, we have a good understanding that potential side effects are not permanent that they tend to only be there in the beginning part of transitioning onto the medicine. But other side effects may actually be um, quite variable, and we don't really know when and if they're going to uh, come up at all. So these are certainly things that you would want to talk uh, with your healthcare provider and their team in terms of what are the expectations for that particular person. And of course, if you do develop side effects, can they be managed? Are there other medicines that can be tried? Are there other strategies that the person can take to try to reduce the risk of those side effects? And of course, what is your risk tolerance? How do you balance potential risks and side effects against the potential benefit of the medicine? So some of our newer medicines that have found to be highly effective for the treatment of MS, they certainly have potential side effects and complications. But what is the tolerance level? How are you going to tolerate a potential side effect or risk compared to the very real risk of the MS continuing to worsen and potentially lead disability? So again, this is a risk tolerance discussion that needs to be had between you and the healthcare provider. Convenience. So how are the DMTs administered? So are they injectables underneath the skin, like an insulin shot? Or are they through the muscle, through an intramuscular injection? Are they a pill that you take once a day? Is it a pill that you take twice a day? Is it an infusion that you go in once a month? Or is it an infusion that you go in five times in one uh, bout in a year? So really trying to talk about how often you are administering and what are the expectations for you in terms of what you feel you will be able to tolerate. That will be a very important discussion point with your MS provider. And then that also leads into how often do I take the DMTs, which we just covered. And then another question, must I have regular tests or visits to other healthcare providers to monitor the effects of my treatment? Well, of course, that is very important to be had because you'll want to have an idea of how often do you need to go to either your local lab or to your local hospital or your doctor's office to get blood work done or urine samples done, and how frequent does that need to be done in order to um, make sure that you, the safety is uh, being surveyed appropriately. And then the last letter of the MSAA search acronym is health outcomes. So some very important questions to consider. How will my general health and quality of life be affected by these DMTs? So this is also very important. And it's important because as a comprehensive MS provider, our goal obviously is to prevent worsening of MS disease, but it's also making sure that your quality of life is not being impacted. 
and that we are also making sure that your other health issues, so if someone has high blood pressure or high cholesterol, that those uh, other medical conditions are being appropriately managed by your family doctor or your internal medicine physician. Making sure that you are remaining tobacco free, not smoking. Making sure that your vitamin D levels are well supplemented because we understand that vitamin D can also lead to worsening of MS and disability. So all of these questions will also be important to have with your healthcare provider in determining whether or not a certain DMT would be appropriate for you. And then, of course, we want to look long term. It's not just how is my MS going to function today and next week, but what am I going to look like in five years, 10 years, 15 years, 25 years down the road? What are my expectations with this particular DMT? And of course, will taking a DMT lower my immune system and cause other problems? So there are some DMTs available that modulate the immune system and can certainly have an impact on certain white blood cells that may potentially have an impact on your immune system. And it will be important to have the question of, is this particular DMT one that I need to be worried about in terms of how my immune system will function and should I expect an increased frequency or severity of infections? So of course, that will be an important thing to discuss with the healthcare provider. And the last question, can these DMTs assist with my mobility, cognition, and other health factors? So cognition is also a very important piece when it comes to MS as we have a lot of growing evidence to suggest that cognitive problems start very early in MS. This isn't something that becomes noticeable only in the progressive stages of disease 20 years down the line. Cognitive problems peak quite early. So it'll be interesting to have a conversation with your patient, uh, with your healthcare provider, in terms of does this particular DMT show any good data from studies or trials in terms of cognition? And of course, mobility. That is one of the most important issues with MS. How is this going to impact the way that I walk over time? And of course, is it going to have any impact on my other health conditions? So the MSAA has produced a wide variety of informational tools um, to help make sure that you are optimizing this search acronym. And uh, some of these things include um, a search booklet that is available with a laminated reference card. And then there's also a workbook that is available to write notes, organize questions for the healthcare provider. And there is an MSDMT chart of the medications that are currently available. And a resource guide listing uh, potential organizations and pharmaceutical assistance programs, which um, is actually quite helpful. And then, of course, the health insurance guide that I had alluded to earlier that also provides some information on the Affordable Care Act and some basic information on Medicare. So going back to the importance of adherence. So once a DMT is started, evidence suggests that treatment needs to be ongoing for those potential benefits to persist. And then any gaps in treatment or folks who you know, take one dose and then they skip the next one, they remember the next one, but then they skip the next two, it can certainly have um, a significant impact in how the medicine works and can certainly predict an increased risk of relapses and progression of disability because it's not being taken appropriately. And understandably, adherence can present certain challenges over time. Uh, so many of those challenges can be managed uh, to keep folks on course. And that brings me back to the importance of being able to find a healthcare provider where you feel that you can have an open and honest discussion of these possibilities. So if you are not taking your medicine 
um, as it is prescribed, it is important to be honest with your health care provider and feel that you can be honest with your health care provider to discuss ways that we can minimize those issues and prevent them altogether. Because if the health care provider is under the assumption that you are taking the medicine compliantly, then they're under the assumption that the medicine should be working at its optimal best. So, some helpful strategies to help build toward ongoing treatment adherence. They include managing the side effects. So, sometimes taking over-the-counter medications to manage temporary flu-like symptoms that some folks can have with some of the interferon medicines, like Avonex and Plagrity and Rebif. Ice down and rotate the injection sites, because sometimes the injections can be painful. So knowing a strategy to help minimize those painful injection sites. Or if there is the availability of an auto-injector instead of using a pre-filled syringe. That might also be helpful in trying to manage some of the side effects of the injectables. Understanding expectations. So again, discuss the realistic expectations with your healthcare provider. Give the DMT at least six months to a year to have a optimal treatment effect. And realize that if you don't necessarily see results, that it actually might be working. That actually means that it, the medicine is doing what it's supposed to do because you're not have any, having any more relapses or new disability. So not necessarily, quote unquote, seeing results might not necessarily be a bad thing. Learning to adjust. So setting a schedule and using calendar reminders or sticky notes to help remember to take the medication. Those are important strategies. So maybe putting a calendar up on your refrigerator or keeping a calendar in an area of the house, such as the kitchen near the coffee maker. Uh, where you are going to frequent um, every single day and making sure that it is in a viewable place so you will not forget to take a look at your calendar or to remember to take your medicine. Um, there are also alarms that you can set, either a clock radio or if you have a smartphone, setting an alarm on your phone. Proper training is needed on self-injection techniques that can be pro uh, provided by the individual pharmaceutical companies, and of course, if problems arise, don't just stop taking the disease-modifying therapy, talk to your healthcare provider. So a couple of take-home messages. View MS as an ever-changing landscape that holds great promise for the future. Recognize that being adherent and remembering your doses of your medicine will help reduce attacks and lessen disability over time. Be proactive in managing your health care. And this will also be important when you're having a discussion with the health care provider. That it's not necessarily just being a passive listener and just doing what the doctor says is best because they're the doctor and they know what's best for you. No, it's about having a conversation with the provider because this is your life and your health and you should have an active participation in making decisions about your treatment strategies and most importantly, your DMT. And of course, that goes to show having a good doctor-patient relationship is highly crucial in making sure that those needs are met. Use search to help discuss MS medications with your doctor and ultimately selecting the therapy that is right for you. So thank you very much for your attention. Well, thank you, Dr. Hurst. That was a great presentation, uh, encapsulating our search program so very well and, and a lot of great helpful information, so thank you. So, okay, it's now time for some questions and answers, and I'm happy to see that there's a lot of activity on the chat box feature, and I've been writing these down uh, as fast as I can, and a lot have flurried in just recently, but I'll, I'll do my best to get them out to you as well. Uh, the first question is, I like this way of using search to think about the treatment, 
but what if I have too many questions for the office visit? How do I get them all answered? That is actually an excellent question. And that is a common uh, concern that is brought up um, in, in clinic. Um, and that's because MS um, is a very complex disease process. And there are multiple syst uh, symptoms that can develop. Um, there are multiple discussion points to have in terms of just the DMT itself. And using the search acronym, you can see how that can be a lengthy discussion. But also, what about other questions like, how do I treat this symptom? And where's the best um, physical therapist in town? So there are a lot of other things to discuss. Um, because um, the time management for healthcare providers um, can be quite challenging, some healthcare providers are only seeing patients in a 15-minute slot. So if those questions cannot be answered, um, there is always the possibility of scheduling another follow-up visit with that healthcare provider. Another strategy is to prioritize questions and make sure that the most important questions that you have, you ask first. You ask first. And then another point is that if you are uh, having your MS being cared for in a comprehensive uh, neurology or MS center and there are advanced practice clinicians available or other nurses, who can help answer questions in an education format, that might be something that's worth asking the healthcare provider if you can make a separate appointment for that. Great response. Uh, just before I get to the next question, I do also want to send out a reminder to folks because a lot did put on the chat box about the availability of this. This will be posted on our website within a week to 10 days as both a recording and then the slides is a PDF file that you can download. And as the, the presentation mentioned, we have a whole section on our website on search with tools. We have the, the brochure. We have a chart. We have a workbook. This slide deck will be there with the webinar. So we encourage people to go to our website to get that information currently. And then we we'll check back in about a week to 10 days, and we'll have this up there as well. Uh, the next question is, and we, boy, we get this a lot, not only just in this program, but on our helpline as well. With health insurance the way it is, should I look at my insurance policy first and then talk to my doctor about treatment options, or talk to my doctor first and then check on insurance? Sure. That is a very common question that I get as well. So um, what I pose to the patients is actually to do the latter point, um, to make sure that you have the discussion with your healthcare provider first in terms of which DMT you both feel is the best treatment strategy for you. And then to go through the motions of insurance approval and whether or not the insurance will approve all of it or if they will only cover a portion of the cost, and then if there are um, available patient assistance programs uh, to help cover the remainder of the cost. So um, I don't want for folks to focus too much on the affordability right off the bat in calling the insurance companies. None of these medicines are affordable out of pocket. The most important thing is to make sure that you establish which medicine is appropriate for you and then start to quote unquote battle the insurance companies. And there are appeal processes that are available um, and the healthcare providers can certainly uh, you know, either do written appeals or they can do peer-to-peer -peer appeals as well. So a lot of the times, just with a little bit of effort on the healthcare provider's part, uh, many of these medicines can actually be approved for, um, for at least partial insurance coverage. Well, that's great. That's great to know. Uh, next two questions kind of talk about the timing of being on these medicines. The first question is, how long should I take DMTs? Indefinitely? That is a great question. So not every, well, first of all, let me preface this by saying that there are no folks living with MS who are exactly alike. 
everyone is different. Everyone has a different disease course. They have different risk factors for disease progression or worsening of disability. They have their own medical conditions that might actually impact the way that MS um, functions over time and how quickly it can progress over time. So no two people are alike. And disease-modifying therapy, as far as the medicines that are currently available, are mainly for the relapsing forms of MS. So generally speaking, I recommend that disease-modifying therapies are used during these more inflammatory stages of the disease in the earlier parts of the MS disease course. But then ongoing, once person reaches a certain age where we think that MS becomes less inflammatory and therefore we think that the MS may have not so much additional benefit with the DMT, it may actually be worthwhile in doing a drug holiday trial and seeing if the DMT can actually be taken off. And of course, it depends on how the person is doing clinically and of course what their MRI looks like. So I understand that it's not a very decisive answer to that question, um, but as far as what we understand now, uh, for the earlier parts of MS, I certainly recommend a DMT be started and maintained. And then of course, as the person ages and it becomes a little bit more intuitive how their MS is behaving, then the patient and the healthcare provider can have a discussion on whether or not the DMT needs to be continued. Excellent. And, you know, this question is, you might have addressed it as well, but I think it's worth asking. Uh, I've been on an injectable DMT for 15 years. Can it still be effective after this amount of time? That is an excellent question. So um, there are folks who actually do quite well on the injectable therapies. And as long as those three pillars are being met, that there have not been any new relapses, there have not been any new MRI lesions, and there hasn't been any accumulation of disability, then it certainly seems appropriate that the injectable therapy can, can be continued. Now, of course, um, other things that are not as easy to monitor over time, and that includes cognition, because we don't really have very effective ways of monitoring cognition long term, and brain atrophy, meaning how much brain tissue loss is there. And it's not always very obvious on a brain MRI how much tissue loss there has been. Those are other things that also need to be considered when discussing the long-term treatment strategy, including the injectable therapies. So that is a big challenge that the MS um, community currently has, and we're trying to come up with more effective ways to monitor and assess if using these medicines, including the injectables long term, can address those things. So that would probably be my, my answer to that. Yeah, very good. Uh, this question probably speaks to the doctor-patient relationship. How do you make the doctor understand that on the day of the visit, I may look fine and present well, but afterwards, I have extreme fatigue and cognitive issues and other symptoms that he doesn't see. That is an excellent question, too. So um, in terms of the fatigue, so one thing that would be um, also important to know is that, you know, fatigue is very common with MS. It's actually one of the most common complaints of MS. But fatigue is not only directly related to MS. There are other things that can certainly um, uh, contribute to someone's fatigue levels during the day. And there are a number of factors. Um, sleep apnea, um, interrupted sleep at night because of um, needing to get up and pee or being in pain all night and therefore the sleep is interrupted. Uh, vitamin D levels being uh, deficient. Um, depression, 
uh, thyroid dysfunction. Uh, so, you know, I could go on and on, but there is a very large list of other reasons why a person can be fatigued other than the MS itself. And in terms of the cognition, that's an excellent question. So, um, one of the most common complaints in addition to fatigue is the cognitive piece. And, you know, until we have a very uh, good, effective, and validated way to follow um, cognition over time, it's a little difficult to establish how much of an impact the MS is going to have on it long term. So those are certainly very important points to bring up to the healthcare provider, but it's also good to be aware that there are other reasons for fatigue and cognitive issues other than the MS itself. Okay, very good. And the last question, because we are running out of time, the last question is kind of a, a, a encapsulation of a lot that was coming in regarding updates on stem cell research, uh, stem cell replacement surgery, and any uh, medication updates for the primary progressive uh, population. Sure. So um, I'll answer the uh, primary progressive question. So um, I had alluded to um, one of the um, upcoming treatment strategies, was, which is ocrelizumab, um, which did show um, positive benefit in those patients with primary progressive MS. So very shortly, we may have a medicine that is FDA approved to treat primary progressive MS. And it, which is unbelievably exciting um, and, and such a huge step forward in the field of MS. Um, to answer the question about stem cell research, so stem cell therapy in MS is still in its infancy. And there have been a lot of clinical trials uh, that, are, that have either gone on, and these are early clinical trials, early phases of the clinical trials that have either gone on or are ongoing currently. And specifically, they're looking at the safety of stem cell therapy and looking at early um, effectiveness measures. Um, and that data is starting to look pretty promising. But a lot of these folks who are being recruited into these trials are highly active folks, meaning that they have very aggressive MS. And um, a question that we um, have not been able to answer just yet is should stem cell therapy be used as a substitution or an alternative to a DMT or should it essentially be used as a quote unquote last resort? And those questions have not yet been answered. But hopefully there will be clinical trials designed so that we can explore that question further. Well, that's a great answer as well as uh, all the answers to these questions. So thank you so much for that, and thanks uh, to everyone for, for sending in such great questions. Well, we are just about at the end of the tonight's program, and before we go, I, I once again want to thank Dr. Hurst for a fantastic job presenting on MS and MSAA search program. So round of applause. You can hear it through my phone. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> uh, I would also like to thank our supporters, EMD Serono and Sanofi Genzyme, and of course all of those who participated on the program tonight. Uh, two quick reminders that again, this will be archived on our website soon, and we have our brief questionnaire at the very end of the program as soon as I stop speaking and you'll be able to see that and please uh, fill in those responses and, and help us uh, learn how we can do webinars in the future with um, different topics of interest. So once again, thank you everyone for joining us and have a great night. Thank you very much.